at this time, I'd like the men Word of everyone. God to come forward. <laughs> Stand in the gap with us. We have the men come forward as leaders of the household and the church and respected in the community. And so we appreciate you coming up here. Dennis, would you pray for us? Good morning. Uh, let, let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for this, this time uh, together. Thank you for allowing us and giving us a place, Lord, that we could come as family and uh, friends and community. Lord, we could worship your name. And thank you that the word of God is preached here, Lord. We pray uh, for Pastor Brent and his family. Lord, that you would give them strength and, and continued wisdom as he leads us in the truth. Lord, we thank you for uh, giving him and his family to us. Lord, thank you for the men of this church. And I pray that you bless each one, Lord, as we serve you and as we love our families and Lord, as we uh, attend this fellowship, Lord, give us uh, love for each other and love for the community. Lord, help us to be a light in the darkness. And Lord, give us the strength to, to be about the gospel in all that we do. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, huh? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. All right. He's good. Amen? Amen? All right. Now we're on the same page. Before we start, there's something I need to tell you. In the bulletin up here, it says, feeling a bit paranoid? Remember, you are not alone. Now, those who don't know God will think, yeah, okay, I'm not alone. It's a funny joke, yeah, okay. But you know what? God's always with you. And that's why you're not alone, ever. We he brings sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We he brings the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord and we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy your turn sacrifice volume went up We he bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. We offer up to you the sacrifices of joy. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy hey amen that's an oldie golden oldie i like to go back a lot and and pull up the the songs that came out of this 
late 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, they, they were just different. They were fresh. And God was on the move. We, we had a revival in the country. Things were going on. And a lot of the songs, though very simple and maybe a little rough around the edges, didn't matter. Scripture songs, people just singing because they love the Lord. They'd been saved uh, out of a life of futility. And so I like, like going back into the vault and getting some, which reminds me, the next hymn is also an oldie. Now, you may be thinking in your mind, aren't all hymns oldies? <laughs> well, this one is from 820 A.D., so it's a little bit older than the rest of them. Oh, glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to him whom the lips of children make sweet hosannas ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's name comes, the King and Blessed One. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King. Hosanna's ring, the company of angels are praising the on high, and mortal men and all things created may reply. All glory, Lord, and all. Hosanna's ring to thee before thy passion they sang their hymns of praise to thee now high exalted our melody we raise here we go all glory oh Lord and honor to thee King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring, thou didst accept their praises, accept the prayers we bring, who in all good delight us, thou good and Thou good and gracious King. They don't write them like that anymore. Hallelujah. He's the Redeemer King, the Blessed One, King of Israel, Son of David, the coming Messiah that all of Israel yearned for and looked for and couldn't see when he arrived. Wow. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song you are good 
good. Oh, you are good. Good. Oh, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins. The echo of my days, oh, he is my soul. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good. are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh. Line of Judah, the beginning and the end, bright and morning star. Jesus said, pray. Pray in this way. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever just analyzed that statement? What you're asking? Teach us to pray, Lord. And so he began, and he began to teach them and said, May your kingdom come, may your will be done, your will, not my will, not so-and-so's will, not the group's will, but your will, O oh God, may it be done on earth here in the midst of where I am. As you've already determined it to be so in heaven. That's a powerful prayer. When you pray it, don't pray it like a formula. Pray it with the realization of what you're asking. And then buckle your seatbelt. Because he'll answer that prayer. May your kingdom come. Got it. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come. May your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Father, establish your kingdom. Father, establish your will in my life. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your will come. May your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven Jesus Establish your kingdom Jesus Establish your will in my life May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come, may your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. He is the King. We were saved to serve the King. Whatever way he chooses, whatever way he designates, we were saved to serve him. In fact, as you go through the scriptures, the new heavens and the new, the new earth, he will fill all in all, and we will be his priests, serving him throughout eternity. What a, what a privilege. We will rule and reign with him throughout eternity. Boy, it makes these 70 some years, whatever you get, it just makes them pale. What? <laughs> all hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel, King of kings. Lord of Lords, bright morning star, and throughout eternity, I'll sing your praises, and I'll reign with you throughout eternity. All hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star. And throughout eternity, 
unity I'll sing your praises And I'll reign with you Throughout eternity Your turn psalmist wrote in Psalm 29 Ascribe to the Lord O heavenly beings Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Unto the Lord, unto the King, holy unto your name, I will. Unto Jesus, holiness unto you, Lord. I love you. I love you. I love your name. I love you. And all my days, I'll proclaim. Unto Jesus, holiness, unto you, Lord.
unto Cry out to scribe, ascribe holiness to your name. You are filled with glory and strength, and your name is above all names. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We hear it as we even read it in the book of Revelation. All peoples from all nations and tongues and uh, languages, all groups, crying out, singing, worshiping you, the, the, the four and twenty elders crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And we do worship you here today, Father. We worship you in the splendor of your holiness. For we recognize that without you, we can do nothing. You are are all in all, and in you we move and have our being. In all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Dale, you got something? Good morning again. I'm up here to take care of something I forgot. Many of you may not believe this, but I'm forgetful. <laughs> and sometimes I make mistakes. Never. Last Sunday was Pastor Appreciation Day. Of course, I blew it. <laughs> Just me, that's all. But Steve told me today that it's Pastor Appreciation Month. There you go. So, we are going to celebrate right now before Coin and Nia. Michelle, would you come up? Pastor, we appreciate you. All of us do. We appreciate Michelle because she has to keep you going. That's her job. <laughs> keep me sane. So, here's a cake we have okay. mm. and flowers for the missus. has a Bible on it, and it said special appreciation for a special pastor. <laughs> While we're here, I want to remind you that the sign-up sheet for the banquet, Karenet Banquet, is over on that table, and we need about eight more signatures or seven. Seven more signatures to get two tables. And it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. So if you want to sign up, please sign up and pick your meal. It's on the 5th of November, Friday. See, I forget to. All right. Go ahead and mingle. <laughs> and eat, cake. eat cake and be healthy. I already want October. The last Sunday of the month. See. Sure, they're in the 38th. Oh. 
Better have my glasses there. No sermon today. Huh? What? You're making a spectacle of yourself. Why? <laughs> well, he's just reminded the 31st we won't be here. Why? It's my birthday lunch at the house. Oh. <laughs> Never mind. But you can go ahead and have it anyway. I just wanted to let you know up front. Never mind that announcement. Let's let's plan it for the next the next Sunday after the thirty first, whatever that is. Probably the seventh. We can't have it. Can't have it. The boss spoke. Yes, ma'am. After Halloween. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. We're somewhere where we're all loved, and he's with us. Today, my message is labeled, What's in Your Lunchbox? The text is John 6, verses 1 through 15. Billy Graham arrived at Atlanta, Georgia airport. He was introduced to his limo driver. And Billy asked him if there was any way that he would be allowed to drive the limo because it was a lifelong wish. He wanted to drive a limo since he was a kid. The driver agreed and on the drive to Atlanta, a deputy sheriff pulled over the limo. I didn't say detective. <laughs> he, went, he went back to his patrol car and he radioed the sheriff that he had a very important person in the car. And the sheriff asked, is it the governor? The deputy replied, no. He said, well, is it the president? The deputy said, no. And the sheriff said, well, who is it? He, the deputy replied, it must be Jesus because Billy's driving the limo. <laughs> Another amusing thing I want to tell you, it's not on the sheet, but there was a lady about 80 years old, and she was in the doctor's office. And he said, how are you doing today? And she said, I'm doing fine. I just got married to an undertaker. And he looked at her and he said, well, that's kind of interesting. How many times have you been married? She said, four. He said, really? What did they do? She said, number one, my husband I married at 20 was a banker and he had a lot of money. She said, when I was 40, I married a ringmaster at the circus. And she said, when I was 60, I married a preacher. And when I was 80, I married the undertaker. And he said, wow, that's a well-diversified group there. How do, you keep them in, how do you keep them in your head? And she says, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> Our text today is, like I said, the book of John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. A great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked, only, he asked this only to test 
him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Introduction. Yogi Berra, maybe some of you haven't heard of Yogi, some of you have, but Yogi was a catcher in baseball for the New York Yankees most of his career. He was a 15-time All-Star. He was a three-time MVP, Most Valuable Player Award winner, and a record 11 times World Series winner, and elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yogi went to his favorite pizza parlor after the game. The cook asked Yogi if he wanted his pizza cut into six or eight slices. Yogi said, you better make it six, because I can't eat eight. <laughs> In this amazing miracle, the Lord Jesus breaks down the miracle into bite-sized pieces so that the disciples could understand the deeper issues of faith contained in the miracle. The feeding of the multitudes is the fourth miracle of seven performed by Jesus recorded in John's Gospel. Each miracle communicates additional truth about the kingdom of God over and beyond Christ's power to meet physical needs. John refers to miracles as signs designated to teach spiritual truth to the saints. As John reveals the miracles, we see an increase in crisis of need moving from running out of wine at a wedding to culminating with raising Lazarus from the dead. Just as the need or crisis increases, so does the miraculous power and glory of Christ increases to meet the needs. In previous miracles, Jesus demonstrated his power, his purpose, and his position. Now through this miraculous meal, Jesus declares his personal identity as the one and only Savior of the world. The miracle, this miracle provides the context for the first of the great I am statements. I am, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am, the, I am the living waters. I am the door for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. And I am the resurrection and the life. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. Number one, reality of adversity. Yogi's pizza had six manageable slices. This miracle could easily be divided into three parts. Examination of faith, distribution of food, and the explanation of following Christ. For this message, 
we will focus on the examination of faith. After traveling with Jesus for almost two years of public ministry, the Lord Jesus decided to give the disciples a test. The scripture says that Jesus asked where they could buy bread because he wanted to test them for he already had some purpose in mind what he was going to do. We can limit what God does in us by assuming what is and is not possible. Is there some impossible task that you believe God wants you to do? Don't let your estimate of what you can't be done keep you from taking the task on. God can do the miraculous. Trust him to provide the resources. We learn from this passage and other parallel scriptures that God leads us into trials to produce us a greater faith. Peter wrote, persecuted saints in Rome, that grief, suffering, and trials refine their faith to be greater than gold. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. This is an important concept to understand because in some Christian community, Some, uh, in some Christian community, they teach walking in obedience to God prevents trials. They propose that God's blessing leads to prosperity, never adversity. But we discover in the scripture that is through adversity, God guides us toward great maturity. Obstacles become opportunities for God to show himself strong. Following Christ is not the absence of a struggle. It is the abundance of strength. Dr. Scott Peck's best-selling book, The Road Less Traveled, begins with the statement, life is difficult. Amen? Amen? This is one of the greatest truths in life because once we see the truth, we can transcend it. Peck claims that most people fail to recognize the reality of inescapable difficulty. Instead, they moan about their problems, expressing a faulty belief system that life should be easy. Only by working through problems can one experience meaningful life. Dr. Peck says the fear, denial, or avoidance of problems is the basis of all mental illness. You may not rejoice in the information that life is difficult, and we all suffer from mental illness to some degree. But Dr. Peck is right on target because that is the lesson that Jesus teaches in this miracle. Through adversity, we learn more about ourselves, but more importantly, we learn about God and his love for each and every one of us. Number two, response to adversity. Illustrated in the disciples' response to the challenge are three choices that we face whenever problems arise in our lives. First, many respond with independence. Philip answers with a typical self-reliance, saying that eight months' wages would not be enough. We can appreciate Philip's quick assessment of that need and translating it into a tangible financial terms. He is willing to work, but he knows that his best effort will fall short. Philip's response is very common in our personal lives and in our churches. Each year, people make resolutions based on individual effort and personal resources. Churches set annual budgets based on what was given last year plus 2%, called a faith increase. In the presence of the King of Glory who created and sustains all things, Philip's best answer to the Lord's question about how to handle a God-sized task is to work hard. The disciples are contrasted with the youngster who brought what he had. They certainly had more resources than the boy, but they didn't have enough. So they didn't give anything at all. 
the boy gave what little he had, and it made all the difference. If we offer God nothing, he will have nothing to use. But he can take what little we have and turn it into something great. Ignorance is the second response. By ignorance, I'm referring to ignoring the problem, not a lack of intelligence. In Matthew's account of the story, he reveals that some of the disciples told Jesus to send the people away. Professional motivator Zig Ziglar says, denial is not a river in Egypt. Some of the disciples adopted a belief system that said, if we don't have to look at the problem, then it's not our problem. Marriages end in divorce because couples ignore problems until massive pain has been inflicted upon each other. Churches avoid reaching out to the most needy and under-resourced because we want to take care of our good families and facilities. Jesus set the example of reaching out to those with the greatest needs, but we ignore those people because they don't fit well with our, in our holy huddles. Ignoring problems is one of the most destructive behavior patterns, robbing individuals and churches of great blessing. The third and best response to adversity is interdependence, which involves working together and with God to solve problems. This response is pictured in Andrew, who brings a boy and his lunch to Jesus. Andrew listened to Jesus preach about the kingdom of God. He witnessed the supernatural power of God. He remembered Jesus turned water into wine. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus could do something special with five loaves and two fish. In performing his miracle, Jesus preferred to work through people. He took what a young child offered and used it to accomplish one of the most spectacular miracles recorded in the Gospels. Age is no barrier to Christ. Let me repeat that one more time. Age is no barrier to Christ. Never think that you're too young or too old to be of service to him. Andrew looks beyond human ability and seeks divine intervention. It's also significant that he doesn't passively presume that God will accomplish the miracle without any human involvement. Jesus could have snapped his fingers and caused the empty jars to fill with wine. But he involved the disciples by having them fill the pots with water. Jesus could make the fish jump in the boat. But he told the disciples to throw the nets on the other side of the boat. The supernatural activity of God does not eliminate human involvement. It elevates our gifts, resources, and abilities to accomplish things we could never do by mere effort. Amen. There is a lesson in leftovers. There is in my house. God gives an abundance. He takes whatever we can offer him in time, ability, and resources, and multiplies its effectiveness beyond our wildest expectations. If you take the first step in making yourself available to God, he will show you how greatly you can be used to advance the work of his kingdom. And in conclusion, I'm convinced that Jesus was asking similar questions of his followers. What are you going to do about the multitudes that have desperate needs? What about your coworker? Or what about your student? Your spouse? Maybe Jesus is testing you in another area of your personal life or calling. What are you going to do with your talents, your resources? An ordinary boy gave an ordinary lunch 
to Jesus. And the bread of life did something extraordinary. What can God do with your ordinary gifts? Remember that Moses led a nation with an ordinary shepherd's staff. David killed the giant Goliath with a simple rock and a sling. Elijah experienced double portion of power expressed through an ordinary cloak. A manger became a crib for Emmanuel. And God used the Roman cross as the vehicle that delivered grace to the world. Oh, child of God, what is in your lunchbox? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the message that you provided. That, and I hope that everyone takes it into heart and does what they can with their ordinary talents, their ordinary gifts. It doesn't matter how old, how young, Lord, if they're willing to use you to perform miracles. And Lord, please be with us every day as things get tougher out there in the world, that we will advance your gospel, we advance your kingdom. And we pray for those who are not here today, whether they're ill or whether they're just sitting it out. Please be with them and their spouses. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.